Well, good morning. It's thrilling uh, to have a health-focused event at the COP. It makes a lot of sense uh, because, after all, our work on climate is to improve the human condition. And health, which allows people to thrive, be educated, and fulfill their potential, is the ultimate measure of whether we are reducing inequity. Nobody would be better off in a world with fewer carbon emissions where we're reducing our interventions to reduce illness, starvation, and death. The reason that climate affects health are multiple. We have vector-borne diseases showing up in places that they never did before. Uh, for example, African cities that are at altitudes that uh, mosquitoes didn't thrive at at the past, uh, the higher temperatures are, are changing that. Uh, when we have flood events, we see not only do mosquitoes thrive, but we also have uh, diarrheal diseases uh, showing up. And then in a direct sense, uh, particularly uh, for people who farm outdoors, uh, there's the effect of heat stress. The WHO has estimated that over the next two decades, uh, climate change will be responsible through these mechanisms uh, for over 5 million deaths. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, we need to remember we've made a lot of progress uh, in global health. The funding for vaccines uh, actually now uh, is at a point where it's saved over 25 million lives. Uh, the funding for HIV has saved over 20 million lives. And if we take these next 20 years, just a disease like TB alone uh, will be over 20 million deaths. So as we think about our limited aid budgets, uh, which there are many, many demands on, uh, one of the key things is to understand whether new pledges uh, are additional. Are we preserving the basic health uh, commitments that we've made, for example, in the funding of, of Gavi and vaccines? I believe that we can do both things. We can stay committed to health and not, not ship resources away and deal with this nexus of health and climate. What does that nexus look like? Well, it primarily comes through the effect on the agricultural system. Uh, kids who are not malnourished are far, far less likely to die when they get infected with diarrhea, pneumonia, or malaria. And so it's through crop failure and worse nutrition uh, that we see uh, potentially in some areas a reversal of the incredible progress we've made cutting childhood deaths in half. Now, on the first day of COP, uh, it was fantastic. We had commitments about food systems and agricultural innovation. So having crops that are both more productive and can deal with these temperature increases and getting more information and credit and advice to farmers will be a major offset. So here we see that health, agriculture, and climate are, are very much tied uh, together. When we think about something like um, malaria, uh, our goal as a world has to be ambitious there as well. Uh, we should want to eradicate malaria. Uh, the climate uh, challenge, for example, the floods in Pakistan, uh, led to thousands of addition, additional malaria deaths there, just to underscore uh, the need to get going on, on getting rid of malaria. We have new tools uh, that are at, the, are at the lab level uh, that decimate mosquito populations. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, which will be led uh, by scientists from all over the world, particularly African scientists, uh, to make sure these are ready uh, to be deployed. But for all of these vector-borne diseases, yellow fever, dengue, malaria, uh, these new innovations give us a chance at a reasonable cost uh, to make progress. And so that dream that even in the face of climate, by investing uh, in these health interventions, you know, not letting that be, be pushed off to the side, and by doubling down on the CG system, uh, we can make progress. Uh, we've had two miracles in development in the past, the Green Revolution and uh, reducing these childhood deaths in half. 
we can take the lessons from those, uh, add our climate investments, and continue to make progress. Thank you.